Ja, dear, dear friends and colleagues, I want to welcome you uh, to our workshop. Uh, these workshops will be live streamed, so we will have also followers in several European countries. Uh, the title of the workshop is Post Acta, how to protect our digital freedom. And many people said, why are you organizing a conference on post ACTA. ACTA is still uh, being debated and ACTA is still on the agenda of, of the European Parliament or of other uh, parliaments as well. This is true, but there's one point that it is quite likely that uh, ACTA will be rejected from this house. This is still not done, but there had been at least uh, four major strikes in the relevant committees, so in, in DEVE, in ITRE, LIBE and URI had been majorities against ACTA and this makes us optimistic. There's also a big pressure from outside the parliament and this is not a negative uh, uh, aspect because I think parliament has to be in contact with us outside. And I, some colleagues sometimes uh, argue that uh, we are not under pressure. Eh? I would see that uh, quite different. I think it is good if we are under pressure, if parliamentarians are in contact with their constituency, and if you are listening uh, to them. And uh, to me, uh, as a, one of the new members, the youngest members yeah, in that sense. Uh, it was important to, to see uh, how uh, the influence of ordinary citizens can change the agenda. So in the beginning of, uh, the, of the, this year, in, 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 in January, it was rather the other way Round, so it was rather that there would be a majority for ACTA, and it was actually the citizens who cont contacted us, who changed the situation, and from, let's say, middle mid, mid February, there was a new, there was a new, uh, a new uh, position in the, in the House, and I think this is important. So we are optimistic that ACTA can be rejected, it is not rejected yet, so it needs uh, still pressure from outside. It still needs pressure from citizens. But I think we have to discuss this also because uh, ACTA is not the right agenda for all these questions we are discussing today. It was just a, 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 a trial which was, I think, not, not appropriate to to um, frame certain certain things uh, we are discussing this afternoon. So uh, it is also necessary to talk about post acta because we have to talk about uh, the freedom of the internet, we have to talk about uh, copyright and all these questions in a more serious, in a more profound way. Um, so I'm very happy to, to have two speakers uh, today who accepted my invitation, Joe McNamee from Brussels. He will talk uh, on fixing, fixing what's broken without not breaking the internet. And he is European Policy Affairs Coordinator of European Digital Rights uh, here in Brussels. And we are really happy that he, he accepted the invitation. I think it was within 10 minutes when I, I contacted you. And he, he, he answered my mail. And uh, the cooperation with EDRI for us is very important because we get uh, information as parliamentarians we would not get without them. So I'm also thanking you very much for coming and for your work and to taking part. 
On my left hand, uh, Leonhard Dobosch is also uh, quite uh, known to many of you. He is researcher at the Freie Universität in Berlin. He has a background, a local background from Austria also, so he's known to some of you. He has a background in business and law, and he works on uh, transnational copyright regulation and alternative forms of copyright licensing, such as Creative Commons, uh, and he's a regular contributor to the German blog Netzpolitik. Uh, he will, his, his contribution will be on enhancing the digital public domain with and without copyright reform. Uh, I will now ask you, Joe, to start your contribution. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, I'm told that a lot of you spent the night in a bus. You, you look remarkably awake. Uh, still. Still. <laughs> I hope that doesn't change by the time I finish my presentation. Um, so, for those of you who don't know uh, me, and know us, European Digital Rights is an association of 32 organizations defending civil rights in the digital world uh, in, from 20 European countries. The point was already made, but I need to make it again. Uh, the most important thing to, to mention at this stage is that ACTA isn't dead. The European Commission is putting enormous efforts into um, trying to get this uh, House, the European Parliament, to uh, not take responsibility and not take the political decision that needs to be made and uh, to delay the vote until after the next European Parliament elections in 2014. Um, the Commission seems to think that parliamentarians will be less, more friendly to ACTA uh, the further away the, the next elections are going to be. Um, we've, I've spent about three years working on, on ACTA. I, most of those three years were uh, years when there was absolutely no hope of ACTA being rejected. Um, when any work on ACTA was a complete waste of time, um, or so it seemed. Um, and um, thankfully the demonstrations uh, happened in, uh, across Europe in February, uh, most particularly in the, uh, the German-speaking countries, the big demonstration in Vienna in particular, and also uh, further east, in, uh, particularly in Poland. So. Um, Thank you for uh, your efforts in uh, not having all of the three years' work uh, go to waste. And uh, <laughs> liebe, liebe Grüße to the uh, Germanophones and uh, Buzaki, or something similar, to the uh, Polish people. Um, the uh, scope of this presentation is actually quite large because there's an awful lot to say about, uh, about post-ACTA and how we defend our digital freedoms. So I'm basically going to give three comparatively short presentations that hopefully won't uh, make you feel more sleepy than you do at the moment. Uh, namely, what exactly are these digital freedoms that we're trying to protect? Um, what are the threats? And how do we actually move forward, particularly in the uh, intellectual property area? One of the biggest problems that I find dealing with, uh, with policymakers uh, and digital rights online is that there's very little understanding about what actually is the value of the internet for society and for the economy. What is it that makes it work? And because if you don't know what you're trying to protect, it's extremely difficult to protect it. And to understand, to understand what it is that's wonderful about the internet, all you actually need to do is wander around the streets uh, in this part of Brussels. Because this whole corner of the city is filled with people whose full-time job it is to create a single market for the European Union, to reduce and get rid of borders in order to allow commerce to flourish and, and to allow the free movement of people from one end of the continent to the other, even if they're travelling by bus overnight. 
the European Union started with borders, with conflicts and with fragmentation and slowly and staggeringly it is becoming more open, peaceful and harmonized. And the, the value of openness for the sake of the citizens and for business is the value of the European Union. And in exactly the same way, it's the openness of the internet that gives it the value, it the value that needs to be protected. It's because the technology is simple and open, it is flexible enough to allow for new protocols to be developed, to maximize the potential for inventiveness and innovation. FTP, SMTP, HTTP, P2P, any P that you care to imagine can be invented and run over the comparative simplicity of the internet protocol. This creates a global internet that allows anybody to create the next big thing and offer their services globally. It also creates a global network that allows activists from Greece to coordinate with activists from Portugal and Britain in order to defend their, their digital rights. A simple hashtag and some conviction is what's needed to create a, a European movement. And if we accept that it's the lack of borders, flexibility and openness that gives the internet its, its value, one can wonder, one must wonder, how we end up faced with so many experiments being proposed for sometimes the most obscure, marginal and unproven reasons. Experiments which put the societal and commercial va value of the greatest internet, uh, the greatest asset that has been created in the last 50 years, at risk. So, what are these risks? The, there's a whole tangle of interrelated measures that are currently being proposed, all of which could be the first domino in, to drop in a process that will undermine our digital freedoms. There is a new regulation on personal data protection, for example. This is unquestionably a good thing. But the copyright lobby is wandering the halls outside uh, trying to ensure that there's nothing in the regulation that will prevent internet companies from undertaking privatized policing measures against their consumers. But why would they do that? Well, the first company that we're aware of to announce plans to police the internet, uh, police their consumers through the use of deep packet inspection was uh, Virgin Media in, in the UK. Virgin Media is an access provider, but it's also a content provider. The bigger access providers are increasingly enter entering the content market, and as some Dutch leaks have shown, the content providers are keen to include spying on consumers as part of their contracts with uh, internet access providers. And these same bigger internet access providers are the ones that are lobbying hard against measures to protect net neutrality. Net neutrality is the obligation to treat all e online information equally and not discriminate for non-essential reasons. Reports from the European Committee of Telecoms Regulators, BEREC, already showed that net neutrality is eroding in Europe, with varying degrees of restrictions on protocols, such as peer-to-peer, -peer, and on services, such as Skype, taking place on an ever more frequent basis. As another example, uh, tomorrow, the Council of Justice and Home Affairs Ministers is going to announce plans for a global alliance against child exploitation online. This isn't a problem, of course, except the document that they will announce includes support for internet blocking. And then we end up with the same problems as we have with ACTA, trans transplanting half a sentence from an existing European directive into foreign jurisdictions with different legal systems, different safeguards, and different protections for free speech. It's nothing short of reckless. And there will also be an announcement shortly by Microsoft that they will donate their photo DNA software to Europol. Photo DNA uh, is already being used by Facebook in the UK as an upload filter. Does it solve any problems? Do we even know what problems it's supposed to solve? Of course not. We don't really care about evidence anymore. It's only free speech and the openness of the internet that's, that we're experimenting with. The European Commission has also announced uh, funding for the development of similar technology uh, so, that this, so that there can be upload filters for video as well. But of course, 
we do have some protections. We have the protections that are guaranteed by the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, the protections in the European uh, Convention on Human Rights, and the Charter of Fundamental Rights. Except we don't really, because all of these measures are binding on states and not on companies. Therefore, there is a big shift among governments and the European Union and the US to move away from laws that would be binding on, sta on uh, companies and towards voluntary measures taken by intermediaries, encouraged by governments and not imposed by them, there thereby circumventing the legal protections. This approach is particularly attractive in the United States. It permits easy circumvention of the free speech provisions of the First Amendment and if they can get support from the rest of the world through international agreements like TPP with the Pacific countries and ACTA, then they can colonize the regulation of the internet globally through the American companies that all citizens worldwide rely on to use the internet. This sounds mad and paranoid, uh, but it's also completely evident from section 104 of SOPA. SOPA is very, very long. Um, SOPA offered complete liability protection under US law for any, quotes, service provider, payment network provider, internet advertising service, advertiser, internet search engine, domain name registry, or domain name registrar, which would withdraw its services if it had reasonable belief that US interests were being um, infringed upon. What does that mean? It means being removed from Google's search index, having your website deleted by uh, VeriSign, which controls all of the .com domain names, etc. And this is one of the most scaring aspects of ACTA. Imagine that the European Union is considering entering into a binding international agreement which requires the US to promote vigilante enforcement measures by, by American companies. The list of uh, threats to our uh, digital rights uh, goes on and on for some, some distance. I'm not going to continue listing the threats because I'm aware of the fact that we're on the third floor of this building and it would be a terrible shame if anybody got so depressed that they threw themselves out of the window. So I'll, I'll leave that section there. So the next, uh, next question is, how do we shape intellectual property law to avoid restrictive measures being proposed in the first place. And there, there's a whole list of important positive steps that need to be made. Firstly, rules that are easy to break and which citizens do not consider to be legitimate will not be respected. Currently, citizens are dancing on the Berlin Wall of a copyright system that is broken. More Stasi and more border police are not the solution. The solution is creating a legal regime that does have credibility. Credibility would be created by a number of different steps. First of all, a fundamental overhaul of the rules concerning exceptions and limitations to copyright. It sounds mad, again, I must stop saying things that sound mad, but European Union rules on exceptions and limitations designed to protect the single market give European member states somewhat over two million options for how to implement uh, exceptions and limitations in Europe. And they do this on a legal basis that it's helping the single market. It clearly isn't. Secondly, there needs to be an overhaul of licensing. In order to provide content on a pan-European basis, even just one song, you need to fill procedure, follow procedures which fill an entire book and even more bizarrely, the, the licensing uh, experts that produced the book also produced a book on how to license outside the European Union. And the book on how to license in the whole world is not as thick as the, license on the, um, the book on how to license within the European Union. Our legal system is more than broken. Thirdly, citizens of Europe expect technologically advanced solutions to deal with complex administrative issues. 
Ownership and licensing information should be embed embedded in digital files to, prom to permit direct payments to be made to creators or, or owners. There is a vast amount of waste and expense created by collecting societies, adding layers of bureaucracy between creators and citizens. A further way of reducing the barriers between citizens and creators is the use of efficient micropayment systems. How much money could be generated if music files had payment details built in, allowing for software tools to read the data and citizens to pay for uh, music they downloaded with the click to pay if they wanted to keep the music and uh, reward the artist. Compare this with the current situation where you have companies like Apple as a middleman between the consumer and the, um, and the artist that offer actually very little added value, value at all. Another point that needs to be improved is uh, that the evidence base. Policy needs to be made on the basis of credible and independent evidence and not an industry research and historical lobbying. You wouldn't believe some of the stuff that's said about ACTA in, in this building. Um, the European Commission is at least now trying to address this point with the European Observatory on Counterfeiting and Piracy. However, that particular organization is currently um, very heavily lobbied by the rights holder side and uh, we need to play our part to, to balance things out. Finally, there needs to be an end to the Homer Simpson strategy in relation to intermediaries. There's an episode of The Simpsons where Homer gets elected to the post of uh, waste manager for the town of Springfield. He won the election using the slogan, can't somebody else do it? The result of him getting elected on that slogan is that the entire city got submerged in rubbish. The European Commission, the United States and individual member states look at illegal activity online and come to the same conclusion as Homer Simpson. Can't someone else fix it? Leave it to the internet providers. The funny thing is that the solution for us is the same as this, uh, the result for us is the same as the result for uh, Homer Simpson. We're getting submerged in rubbish, whether it's data retention, uh, internet filtering, internet blocking, uh, passenger name records in the air, air uh, travel industry. Somebody else is being asked to do it and somebody else can't do it. In conclusion, we cannot protect our digital freedoms until policymakers un understand that the openness of the internet is a huge asset that has to be protected. They need to understand the fact that it is not something that can be experimented with without risk. They need to understand that privatizing online regulation and exporting it into the hands of foreign, mainly American companies, imposing foreign laws in Europe is a catastrophically bad idea. We need measures to protect, prevent companies from taking the law into their own hands and not international agreements asking them to do so. For copyright enforcement, we need laws that are credible, credible enough to be enforceable. And that credibility um, can only be created by the reforms that I mentioned earlier. And finally, the biggest single thing that we can do now to protect our digital freedoms post-ACTA is, is for citizens to remain vigilant and to kill ACTA first before moving on to the post-ACTA world. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joe. Leo? Yes. Um, thank you very much for inviting me here to uh, Brussels. And um, I brought some slides. Uh, I have to, uh, in a way, uh, support with pictures uh, my uh, not so good English. I hope uh, I, I would be nevertheless understood. Um, and uh, I'm very glad that I'm here uh, in this, as the Chinese would call it, interesting times. And um, I think even though I, I completely agree uh, with Joe that, with both Joes, uh, that uh, we should, first of all, kill ACTA before um, thinking too much about post-ACTA. I would also say it's a danger to think if we killed ACTA, then uh, everything is fine. Because not everything is fine. 
uh, right now. And I also think one of the problems with ACTA and with other similar treaties before was that we didn't have a plan, or at least there was no movement that wanted to move Creative Commons uh, uh, copyright in the, in, the, in the right direction. Um, I want to make three points in my talk. And um, the first one deals with the first intervention that uh, someone like Joe, after his talk, would regularly get, I suppose. I, I, I suppose you hear that often, which is, but what about the artists? And what about the authors? And what about the creators? And what uh, should they live from? And how should they make a living? So the, the first point I'm uh, going to make is the digital technology is not the problem, at least not in that regard. The second point that I'm going to make then is that I uh, want to show that I want to convince you that still we do have problems with copyright. And then as a last point, I'm going to suggest two avenues for addressing these problems, one with copyright reform and one without. But let's start with the first point. And I will start with two quotes. Um, the, in this audience, uh, the first one is safe. In other audiences, I have to, to warn uh, the audience that I'm going to uh, you know, make the, um, in the Austrian tradition, the Thomas Bernhard-like start. But uh, in this, uh, it's, it's, it's from uh, Douglas Adams, the author of The Hitchhiker's Guide uh, Through the Galaxy. Uh, and it reads as follows. Anything that is in the world when you are born is normal and ordinary. And it's just the natural, uh, natural part of the way the world works. Anything that's invented between when you're 15 and 35, so most of you here, um, is new and exciting and revolutionary, and you can probably get a career in it. Anything invented after you're 35 is against the natural order of things. And I think this is something that we are you know, uh, experiencing right now uh, due to digital technology. And I, and as a perfect illustration for this first quote, to Adam's point, um, is my second quotation, which reads as follows. A tuneless future is the writing on the wall. If today and tomorrow the music industry is not able to solve its economic, economic problems, the day after tomorrow, in spite of all the super technologies, there would be hardly any music left that could be copied. Sounds like just another story um, about how digital technologies destroyed the music industry. Sorry, I have to disappoint you, but I have to admit I have taken this uh, quote out of context. Namely, out of, uh, the quotation is taken from the closing paragraph from an article published in the German Quality Weekly Der Spiegel in 1977. I only omitted the first sentence. The first sentence read, more and more empty tapes are sold. Um, and in a way, the, in, in this four-page article, the Spiegel warned that home taping has fatal consequences for the music scene. Not only the Spiegel had, had this opinion, also in the UK, we had uh, campaigns uh, funded by the, and this is an actual poster, so that's not fake or made up. In 1980, the Music Industry Association started the campaign, home taping is killing music, and it's illegal, you know, so you are criminals, home taping, uh, you know, for the younger of you, tapes, this is <laughs> uh, something that was before the CD. Um, but, um, of course, as we all know, um, that was not the case. Tapes didn't kill the music industry. Uh, quite on the contrary, the following decades were somehow the golden age of the record industry, of, these, of those very companies that funded uh, campaigns like that. But, of course, is the situation so much different today? or might be true today what was wrong that, uh, that time. So, because again, we see intimidating campaigns, um, we see dystopic images, especially in Germany, we recently had a campaign uh, where uh, authors are getting killed by guys with anonymous masks and their hearts are torn out of their bodies and so on. Or, and, and also the music industry has campaigns that are not so innovative at all. Does it work? Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Now it's not home taping, it's copying that kills the music, but you know, <laughs> it's uh, actually really the same story. But could it be that um, actually we are now facing a tuneless and movieless or maybe even bookless future because digital copying is so much different compared to uh, analog copies? Recent studies by uh, colleagues from Harvard, Oberholt, Sagi, and Strumpf argue that at least quantitatively, this is unlikely to be the case. Um, over the last years, at the height of the file sharing panic, uh, what we could observe was an unprecedented growth in the number of feature films released per year, in the number of music albums released per year, and the number of books released per year. And of course, it's not just not only the distribution is getting much cheaper, also the production of creative works is getting much cheaper due to digital technology. But of course, it's only quantity, that's just the mere numbers. More recent studies have, however, corroborated that findings, such findings and report even that for all those industries that are allegedly mostly affected by uh, all those evil file sharers, I suppose some of you are among them, um, and uh, they even uh, sum it up with the skies rising. So not only the, quant the number of works produced is rising, also the revenues created with those works are rising, and they are rising constantly. So at least in total. But what about the artists again? Because this is industry numbers. And could it be that the industries are thriving, but the artists are losing? And again, we have a study. And this is um, a study by the PRS for Music. That's for the Austrians. That's the pendant to the German, uh, to the Austrian AKM. And for the Germans, that's the pendant to the German GEMA. Pardon? Yeah. Um, and the PRS for Music, they, uh, um, made a, they, they funded a, stu a study on how revenues also for artists um, developed from 2003 to 2008, also in the, at the height of the file sharing panic. And as you can see in this graph, or actually you can see a lot of things in this graph, um, at least three uh, insights I want to mention. First, people do not spend less on music. On total, they just spend it differently. So one might say the share of household income that people spend on music even grows slightly, but more money went into tickets for live performances and less into buying records. Second, only a very small share of revenues um, earned via selling records or downloads actually benefits the artists. You can see this is a very small line in the middle. Um, so even though this share of record sales is decreasing, the artists are not the ones that are losing most by this. Um, since the share of the income based on record sales was so small anyway, the related decrease uh, was not very problematic. With regards to live performances, it's the other way around. The artists reserve a bigger share, and the overall share of live revenue is increasing. So in a nutshell, one might argue um, that um, the artist, in a way, at least on the aggregate may even profit from this development, from this digitization, from this file sharing dynamics. These are, however, aggregate numbers. They do not account for the distribution of income among artists. And this brings me to my second point, that we indeed do have problems with copyrights. But I would argue these problems are different to those that are most heatedly debated. They, we have other problems. And let me st stay at the issue of artist income for another minute. Um, there again, colleagues, this time from the UK, Martin Kretschmann and Philip Hardwick, that made a similar study comparing the income of authors from um, Germany and the UK. More, they they uh, send a questionnaire to over 20,000 uh, authors. And we are talking professional authors here. So only those authors that devote more than 50% of their time to writing. So not you know, the, the guy who writes in his spare time his novel for you know, 30 years, but really people devoting fifth, more than 50% of the time to writing. And what they found is that 60% of those authors, these are journalists, these are novelists, whatever, cannot solely live from writing alone and need a second job to survive. And this study was conducted before the Kindle emerged, so no ebook downloads that time. Um, but let me further demonstrate how big of a problem um, we are talking in terms of income distribution among artists um, and show you a second slide. 
which deals with the Gini coefficient for wider incomes in these two countries. Just to explain the Gini coefficient, the Gini coefficient is a measure of equality. Uh, a Gini coefficient of one means one person is getting all the income. A Gini coefficient of zero means all people get the same, receive the same income. Um, in reading this graph, let's start on the right-hand side. Uh, the Gini coefficient for the income of all employees in the UK and Germany is about 0 0.3. So, of course, no equal income distribution, but hey, we're talking capitalism here. Um, the next columns show how the total income of riders and we can see that the distribution is substantially more unequal than among the rest of the population. So when you go to the next side, total income of riders, more, in, more unequal income distribution. But when we, however, only look at income that directly is related to writing itself, not also the other jobs they have, it's getting even more unequal. And most unequal is the distribution of income that is directly copyright related namely the income derived from the collecting societies. So um, Hardwick and uh, Kretschmer even sum up their findings that the more copyright related the income stream, the more extreme is the distribution of income. A very small number, a small number of very high earners earn a disproportionate share of total income. So in a way, this, I, I tell you this story about the artist incomes because there's always this myth that all the poor artists out there they lose their money because you are downloading. And I would say that's a myth. That's just, in this to, uh, generality, it's just not true. In a way, if we uh, would engage in copyright reform and if we would do something that would broaden the income base for artists, it's very likely that the majority of artists would profit from such a development. But what's beyond the distribution of, uh, and, the, and the income effects of, of copyright? Why am I talking here about copyright? Why did Joe invite me to come to Brussels, to Brussels to speak about copyright in the midst of the greatest economic crisis since World War II? Why are we having this conversation? And, and actually, I think that's a good question. And, and why are so many people interested in ACTA? Why are they going uh, out in the streets? Uh, why are you, you here in this, <laughs> uh, in this uh, session on copyright? And the reason is simply that something has changed over the last 20 and 30 years. And let me invite you to join me in a little thought experiment, which I have copied, taken, stolen, whatever. I know I'm giving attribution, so it's no, it's no plagiarism. Uh, from the US copyright scholar, Jamie Boyle. And he says, let's start. Um, now, all of you, imagine 30 years ago, 1970s or 40 years ago, 1970s, someone walking up to you, handing you a book or a record or a movie reel you know, some, some copyrighted work. And then he tells you, quick, do something that the copyright law forbids. Violate copyright. That's not so easy. If it's a movie reel, you would have to organize a projector, you would have to organize a room, you would have to organize a showing, you would even have to collect entrance fees, and in the end you might have violated copyright. Yeah, that was in the 1960s, 1970s. But now, 30 years later, give someone a smartphone and ask him the opposite question. Don't violate copyright. And again, that's not so easy. Yeah? Because if you have a smartphone and you know all these smartphones, they have video features. Sorry, can I avoid you? So what, what are people doing? They are, um, they, they are filming themselves when they are dancing to their favorite songs. And I'm sure all of you know it's just two clicks away from sharing this video with the world uh, on YouTube, on Facebook, or on your private blog. And that's actually what <laughs> these devices are made for. That's why they have a camera. That's why they have the sharing button. So um, in a way, um, it's in their day-to-day -day practices that it's difficult to not violate copyrights. And that is something that has changed. Copyright plays a role in the day-to-day -day life of ordinary people and not just copyright lawyers or copyright researchers as I am. And I, I suppose that's the reason why we are having this conversation. And let me give now three examples for uh, um, why this is a problem and, what, and then I will uh, turn to what we can do about it in terms of copyright reform. 
The first one is, and th this is the example I just made, transformative consumption. That in our day-to-day -day practices, oh, I'm moving backwards, I'm sorry. I wanted to show you some videos to wake you up. Uh, maybe some of you know this uh, video already. It's the nine month year old Holden Lentz. giving a dance performance to Prince with Let's Go Crazy. Uh, if, I didn't recognize the song, but a Universal Music Group did, Prince as well. And uh, the mother, who of course uh, shared this uh, video with her mother, with the grandmother of Holden, uh, to show her uh, proudly how great of a dancer her son is, uh, received a costly warning and um, was, uh, yeah, was ordered to take down uh, this video, actually, in the um, that's what happened. Uh, actually, in the U.S., she could make a counterclaim because it was fair use. I will come back to that later on. But in Europe, actually, there is no limitation to copyright that would allow you to put such a video online. So if you're doing that and you receive a, a warning, it could cost you some uh, hundred euros at least. Um, and uh, just because. Uh, such a video uh, was uh, made available to others online. Second example, amateur art. The, the great thing about digital technologies, and, and uh, Joe uh, said a lot about the digital rights aspect, but there's also an empowerment aspect connected to digital technologies. More and more people can be creative and can share their creative works with others. Then, and, and when I'm speaking of amateur art, I'm not speaking about amateurish art. I'm just speaking about art that's created first and foremost for the fun of creating for, and for the fun of sharing what you create. And, and anyone who has ever watched some of these uh, viral YouTube videos um, knows what I'm talking about. And let me give you also two very short examples for amateur art. The first one uh, is the new art form that in a way emerged with YouTube, namely to fit videos to misheard lyrics. So, um, I'm, I'm not sure whether this recording of, uh, of O Fortuna is copyrighted, but actually most of works uh, available on YouTube with similar, uh, with similar misheard lyrics videos, of course, violate copyright in a way. That's the only way how you can make such, such amateur art forms. Second example, and I'm sure some of you may know it because it's one of the most watched uh, YouTube clips of all time. But it's instructive in another sense. Um, it's a rather unorthodox walk down the aisle. It has received over 70 million views on YouTube. But the funny thing is, the song Forever from Chris Brown that you're hearing in the background, it was already out of the charts. The commercial life of this song had ended. But because of this viral video, people started to buy the song again and it re-entered the charts and climbed higher than it had climbed before. But of course, coming from Germany, I'm sorry, but you see only this there. Um, and the funny thing is, you really have a win, win, win situation in that case. You know, you have the amateur artists 
who, who have their fun and who are able to share it with others. You have uh, the artists who sells more records and you even have the record company who earns more money. So really there's win, win, win for everyone in this case. Of course, not all cases are like that. But uh, again, this is an example that if we relax some copyright regulation, some rules, it doesn't mean necessarily that we are opening a black hole that we swallow all of our cultural industries. That's just not happening. Uh, but even more important is if we are not changing our laws, works such as these would still be illegal and people would not only not be able to share it on YouTube, but they wouldn't even be able to share it on their personal blog. And I would say this is just plain wrong. Last example, because what I hear after showing these examples often is, yeah, but that's just YouTube. And you know, there are problems out there in the world, you know, uh, and uh, if we don't have, so, and if people wouldn't watch these videos, they would watch others. And of course, there, there's something uh, true with that. But also, there are other more, I would say, salient problems. And that's the problem uh, with orphan works. The constant expansion that we experienced over the last decades in terms of copyrights, an expansion in terms of copyright <coughs> of scope and protection terms has led, has, has more and more made copyright to become the major barrier to our common cultural heritage. When I'm talking about orphan works, I'm talking about works that are no longer commercially available. So you cannot go into the store, you cannot go to Amazon and buy them because they're no more commercially available. But uh, you also cannot get them elsewhere because clearing the rights is too expensive, but they are still copyright, copy protected. And the number of these orphan works is directly related to the length of the copyright term. The longer the copyright term, the more those works there are. And the all rights reserved automatism of contemporary copyright, which means if a work is created, it's automatically copyright protected and all rights are automatically reserved versus this situation significantly. It's because of this automatic uh, copyright protection that even though the huge majority of works is no longer commercially exploitable after 10 years, 100% of works that are published are still protected for decades. So in a, in a nutshell, while, protection cycle, uh, while exploitation cycles of works are getting shorter and shorter, protection terms get longer and longer, and the only one profiting of this development is the tiny fraction of long-term bestsellers, or more precisely, the rights holders of these tiny fraction of long-term bestsellers. In a way, Walt Disney says, thank you, and uh, we all pay. What is the outcome of this, and uh, people, this situation, it leads in turn to something that others refer to as the missing 20th century. This is a, a study, uh, it's still work in progress by a colleague, uh, by the colleague Paul Heald from uh, uh, also from a US university, I think you're Illinois. Um, uh, the chart shows a distribution of 2,500 newly printed editions of fiction books uh, selected at random from Amazon. And um, what's so crazy about this is that there are just as many books available um, from the last decade, 2000 to 2010, than between 1910 and 1920, even though today there are much more books published. Why? The reason is beginning in 1923, most titles were copyrighted and books uh, published later on tend to get out of print. Nobody can afford to clear the rights and so they are not anymore available. So in this chart you really can see uh, in German, die Lücke des 20. Jahrhunderts, you see the missing 20th century. There, there are a lot of books people would be, even, even if you wanted to pay for them, there was no possibility for you to get them legally. So last example in this regard and then i'm uh, coming to the to the last points of my talk and making some concrete suggestions uh, but even more problematic than in the case of books because you could argue okay these books they are still in the libraries and maybe sometimes we, we will be able to to digitize them and google is doing something like that but we can talk about this this is also some downsides but there are a lot of of documentaries that are literally rotting in the archives because the material of these documentaries 
is not made to last for longer than 20 to 30 years. And if we cannot afford to digitize them soon, we will never be able to do so. What can we do about these problems that I now sketched? Because uh, the current copyright regime is broken, as Joe said. And if we manage to kill Akter, uh, the greatest achievement would be that we are not cementing this copyright regime. And then we have the option, that we have the possibility to change something about these flaws that I just described. And, I, and as the subtitle of my talk indicates, I would say there are two strategies. There are two complementary avenues for addressing these problems. One is copyright reform. And uh, one, and there is another avenue without copyright reform. They don't exclude each other. And this is also why I would suggest to <laughs> pursue both of them. But let's start with the copyright reform avenue. And I must say, I'm really, really happy to be able to talk here in Brussels about this. Because every time when I'm, not, when I'm talking about this issue in Austria or Germany, I, I always have to admit that the national level, um, there is only limited uh, things that you can do. And so finally, I'm at the right place to make these suggestions. And so I, I'm, I'm I'm also apologizing that I'm stretching my time now, but I'm, I'm really glad that I have the, op the possibility to first, uh, for the first time, deliver su these suggestions in, in Brussels, and I'm really happy to be here also because of that. So, as I mentioned before, uh, this whole problem with transformative use, with remix, and, 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 and so on, they are, these problems are more salient in Europe than in the US. In the US, they have a more general fair use clause, as it's called, so a more general exception to copyright, which allows many different types of uses that are not explicitly codified in copyright law. This makes the US copyright law much more adaptable and flexible than the European copyright law. It's, of course, it's, it has also its flaws, and it's, it's also not so predictable as the, the U European system. But um, what we have, and, and Joe mentioned that, so I can, and can be brief, in Europe we have a closed and exhaustive list of copyright limitations and exceptions that are codified in the European Copyright Directive and no member state is allowed to go beyond that limitations and exceptions that are codified in, US, in, in European law. And my suggestion in this regard is simple and you also brought this metaphor of the Berlin Wall and um, yeah, rephrasing uh, a famous quotation with that regard uh, is open up this list. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> really, we, we, we have this, this exhaustive list which really restrains our uh, also innovative capabilities, also in economical terms. Every time someone is inventing a new technology, a new online service that, that is um, get infringing copyright in this area of the limitations or exceptions, we would, we would, in theory, have to change uh, the European Copyright Directive. And I'm sure some of you here know changing a European directive is not something that you uh, do uh, between lunch and, and dinner, uh, but takes yeah, some time. Lunch 2012. And, and dinner 2015, 2015. yeah. <laughs> so this is, this is something that, that really, I think, has to be tackled. And I think this should be one of the top priorities post acta for lawmakers in Europe to open up this list, this exhaustive list, to introduce new uh, limitations for remix, for transformative consumption, and maybe even introduce a more general kind of fair use clause. But I would also suggest to not get rid of the other exceptions. I would really say we can even go beyond the system in the US by keeping our limitations and adding a generalized uh, kind of fair use clause. But this, of course, wouldn't solve the problem with orphan works. In this regard, the best thing would, of course, be to radically shorten protection terms. But I'm also aware of the fact that we just have lengthened them. So it's very unlikely that in the short run, uh, oops, uh, that in the short run we will be able to shorten them again. But what we could do in leaving the, the protection terms, at least for those works that are still commercially exploitable, and these are the ones that are the the rights holders are most interested in intact, we could start to introduce a work register on the European level and say for that after a certain period of time, let's say 28 years, um, only those works continue to be, protect, uh, to be protected uh, that were listed in this work register. This would constitute some kind of a use it or lose it clause. Only those works that are still 
used commercially that are still available, only those works that I can buy at Amazon or other uh, online distributors. Those are the works that are still protected and works that are not available commercially. Those works fall into the public domain and people can use it as, and we can use it as our common cultural heritage. I'm coming to the last slides, namely the second avenue. What can we do without copyright reform? Because as, as we, are, we all agree here, changing European copyright directives is a laborious task. It takes years. But there are several things that not only the lawmakers, but also all you that you are here sitting can do immediately to at least weaken some of the flaws or, 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 that, that Joe also mentioned in, in our contemporary copyright. And this is to support and demand Creative Commons or other forms of open licensing. As mentioned earlier, our copyright, our conventional copyright is an all rights reserved copyright. Automatically, all rights are reserved. This is a problem, especially in those cases where the creators don't have a problem if others would use their works, where they say, use it. I don't, I don't want uh, to prohibit you from using the work. But the problem is, without asking, you can never be sure. You always have to clear the rights. And clearing rights is important. And that's the point where Creative Commons helps. Creative Commons licenses are a tool, a simple tool, that allows creators, and all of you are also creators when you are, all of, I have several of you have brought their cameras, they took pictures. If, they, if, you are load, if you are uploading these pictures later on to your blog or whatever, if you are choosing a Creative Commons license, you can say, for example, you can use those pictures on others here in the room, can use those pictures on their blogs if they give me attribution. And you even can choose another clause that would say, um, you here in the room and all the others who are from private blogs, they may use it, but if a Bild Zeitung or Konen Zeitung or any other commercial outlet wants to use it, they have to ask and they have to pay me. Yeah? So these are the licenses. Uh, there are several license options you can use and you can combine. But what they have in common is they allow others to share and remix your works without having to ask. And um, luckily, since its foundation in 2002, Creative Commons has kind of emerged as a standard for this open licensing. Prominent examples for users of Creative Commons licenses are, I'm sure you all know it, uh, use it every day, Wikipedia, the online encyclopedia, but also adding to the example of the photo, uh, the photo example I mentioned, um, the, float, uh, the photo hosting site Flickr is also uh, supporting to license uh, your works under these Creative Commons license schemes. Still, I have some recommendations for politics, for policymakers, because I'm here in the parliament. And I think also they can do something in this regard. As I said, support and demand Creative Commons licenses. What they could do, for example, is to reform guidelines for subsidies or cultural subsidies where works are produced. I'm not speaking of a Creative Commons mandate, so I don't, I'm not suggesting that all works that are publicly funded should be openly licensed. But what I suggest is that why not adding a 10% subsidy bonus to works that are licensed openly because more people are, have the possibility to use those works because the public at large benefits from these open licensing schemes. Such a proposal is not just pure theory. My Austrian hometown Linz, um, European capital of culture in 2009, has in the beginning of this European capital of culture year introduced such a clause. So in there, of course, but that's just communal levels. There's not much subsidies, but this is scalable. You know, Why not <coughs> introducing similar clauses on higher levels, even the European level? Another example is support new business models that are compatible with Creative Commons licensing. And I'm sure several of you have heard about Kickstarter and uh, the possibilities allows artists to collect funds prior to even making their works. And these new crowdfunding models, they are compatible with Creative Commons licensing. And recently the US Congress, they don't get past any laws, but they, even this uh, US Congress could um, agree on a law supporting such crowdfunding models. Um, the last two points, these are, these are things where I would say policymakers should support Creative Commons. But there are also areas where I'm in favor of mandates. And these are the last two examples of my presentations. Um, 
the one field is my own field, research. In addition to supporting Creative Commons, I think it's um, policymakers, and I think the European, level, uh, the, the European Union is, at least in this regard, they are on the right track. There need to be open access mandates. Science and research that is publicly funded has to be released under Creative Commons licenses so that the public at large is able to um, access it. And another issue, and I think some people here in the room are also struggling with expensive educational materials. I think when, op when educational materials or resources, books and so on, are publicly funded, I also think it's fair to say there should be a mandate to Creative Commons license these books so that at least the online version is available for free for both learners and teachers. And uh, such an open educational resource scheme, uh, together with other suggestions, would then maybe uh, bring us closer to, and this is, uh, and let me close with this vision because I'm here at the s and uh, uh, group and, and you know, uh, I heard that in the distant path, socialists and Democrats had something like a vision. Uh, and um, still, yeah. <laughs> and, still and, some and I've taken a quote from, and I, I'm going to I start it with two quotes. I'm going to end with a quote. It's taken from the web page of the Wikimedia organization. That's the organization behind Wikipedia. And they, and they say, imagine a world in which every single human being can freely share in the sum of all knowledge. And I think that's maybe we can we cannot not in our lifetime but i think the suggestions that i made would bring us at least a tiny step closer to this vision thanks thank you thank you leo uh, before i i open the discussion um, joe just wants to make a short remark the U.S., the, the fair use thing um, that the U.S. has compared with us is quite interesting. We, we can't get access to content that's available under fair use in the U.S. But what's interesting is that only um, uses which are, do not interfere with the exploitation of the work can be put under fair use. So the content that's not available to us is content that, if it were available to us, wouldn't be interfering with the, the author's rights anyway. And this puts us into a, comp a very bizarre situation, particularly um, in, a, in a privatized enforcement world. Because um, if we take uh, the example uh, from earlier on, uh, content is available in the US, but it's on YouTube that's blocked to us because it's probably contrary to, to European law. We have 27 different laws. So YouTube takes it down, not because it is contrary to uh, European law, but because it's probably contrary to some European laws. So um, we have content restricted to us because it might breach European law. On the other hand, um, it's not very widely known, but Google enforces US uh, copyright law globally. So if the US receives a notice that, uh, if Google receives a notice that content is, uh, is unauthorized uh, online, then uh, it removes the content from its global index. So if something is contrary, if Google believes that something is contrary to US law, then it doesn't appear in European searches, so we're subject to US law, and in the example just given, when it's available under US law, then we're subject to European law, and we can't see it either. <laughs> it really is quite a bizarre situation, and uh, when, you, when you imagine that copyright is supposed to protect our culture, um, when it actually just creates barriers between us and our culture, that's uh, an unacceptable situation. That was my brief okay, response. Thank you. So, the floor is open. Who wants to raise questions? Uh, Evelyn, do you want to intervene? Evelyn Ring is a member of the Jury Committee, colleague from Austria. Um, thank you so much for your presentations. <coughs> uh, it was really encouraging. Uh, 
uh, what we're doing right now, and I really would like to force all members uh, dealing with uh, uh, with a copyright issue that uh, they listen to a repetition of your input right now. There was enormously much in it, and it is really absolute. Uh, how should I say? It's so it's so fresh to listen to you because we're used to completely different presentations. I can assure that to you. We believe that, that, yeah. Um, uh, somehow that should be the bridge to more or less coming down back to earth, uh, to, to, to the world we are living in. So uh, you mentioned uh, open works, so somehow uh, the political direction is going into a completely different one. And you uh, were also referring to the collecting societies, where I simply would like to ask a question. Um, you were just giving very nice examples on who is really uh, uh, more or less uh, having the advantage of the existing system and therefore more or less uh, 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 wishing to continue and to strengthen even uh, this unjust system. We are right now facing um, a, a, a proposal concerning the collecting societies and I can assure you they are already uh, showing up yeah, frequently, one after the other. And most of them are simply, and therefore that's the question right now, because we have to find answers. Uh, and uh, one, of the, uh, uh, one of the questions uh, rising is always the one, we, the collecting societies, we are not only the one who are earning money, a lot of money on, on artists, but we are also the one protecting artists. We are protecting them, we are offering social insurance, we are offering support for artists who are uh, not so interested in, in dealing with all these topics. And therefore my question is, what to answer them? So your presentation is absolutely convincing, but we have to face them. Mm -hmm. And the second question in this uh, 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 context is, we have the big ones and we have the small ones. It's always the, the game of the internal market. Let's take the salami tactics. Let's say, okay, open the markets. And then the smaller ones are, are under pressure. Some big ones, German, French, uh, British one, ones may, might survive, interfere uh, in the markets. And somehow, uh, should we also make a difference then between collecting societies and more or less uh, taking on board? So that's for, for more or less for the beginning my, my, my first question. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thank you. So, Joe? Um, there was a, a very long uh, meeting in this room yesterday uh, on the reform of the collecting societies um, where the collecting societies raised all of their, uh, their normal uh, concerns. Um, the problem that, we're, that we have at the moment is that the collecting societies are incredibly complicated and then incredibly complicated across the European Union. Um, I, I had a discussion with uh, one um, music um, producers association the day before yesterday and I, my question was look, do you accept that no collecting society in Europe has a, a procedures that are fundamentally anti-creator? Um, and she said, yes, I can accept that. And I said, well, if none of them are anti-creator, why do all of them have different procedures? You could harmonize all of the procedures and not have any loss for the creators. And she said, well, yeah, but if you imagine that it's the UK system that's, that's being promoted, then the Spanish would feel uncomfortable, and that would be unhelpful. And I said, yeah, but the more complicated it is, the less transparency that you have, the longer it takes for the artist to get paid, everybody along the whole chain is losing, and still you don't want streamlined measures and she said well it's complicated and that doesn't help and the, so all of the things being equal this uh, complexity and this lack of harmonization is bad but then corruption hides behind uh, transparency it tried uh, behind complexity and if you look at uh, the scandal in <coughs> Spain and you look at the multiple rolling scandals in Belgium, they, they can, they're, so, they're so complicated they can run several scandals simultaneously. 
while at the same time taking internet providers to court, asking them to infringe fundamental rights. Um, the complexity isn't just bad for, um, for artists and for citizens. It's, it's bad for law enforcement in this area. So um, the reform that's going to come from the Commission is going to be, I suspect, like the reform on um, orphan works, not ambitious, and um, the Parliament is likely not to have the courage again to, to demand more uh, than the Commission is offering. What we need is rigorous removal of the complexity, rigorous transparency, and an awareness of the fact that what the collecting societies do are, isn't always necessary. There, if you listen to a, a presentation by the online games industry about how they experience the internet, they say the internet is fantastic. In the old days, we had producers, distributors, transporters, a whole chain between us and our, uh, and our consumer. Now, we've got our online games, we can communicate directly. We've got rid of all the middlemen. With collecting societies, there's no particular reason why a radio station setting up in Latvia can't, couldn't simply have all of the licensing information embedded in digital files that they were playing and pay them automatically. There's no need all the time for the intermediary, for the, the middleman that's creating uh, a job for themselves to do. It's like I remember going to a, um, a department store in East Berlin before the wall came down. And around the whole, all of the shelves, there was a counter, so you couldn't actually get to the shelves. Somebody was employed to say, what would you like? I'll take it from the shelf for you. Um, and the collecting societies remind me of those people. They're not always needed. They are needed sometime. But I, I think that the, the reform that's underway at the moment won't look at that. It will seek to reform a little, but not a lot, and leave the barriers between the citizen and, and the creator. And on the point of them, them supporting uh, artists and them supporting culture, most of that is from private copying levies. So you see um, events sponsored, the GZAC event, uh, the GZAC concert. People that are going to the concert don't realize it's not the GZAC uh, concert, it's their, con uh, their concert that they paid for when they bought a printer or when they bought a computer, when they paid levies on it. And they're advertising their se themselves using, using the citizens' money. So I'm sure that could be done efficient, more efficiently too. But from a more, more legal perspective, I'll hand over to you. Okay. Yeah. Uh, my, my own uh, experience is also that it's hard to uh, argue and discuss with the representatives of collecting societies. And I'm often surprised because uh, I think uh, a lot of, of the money that are, they are collecting <laughs> is not affected from the co from, from internet at all. And it's, um, and I, I also happen to, to get to know more and more artists that are even harder and stronger in criticizing the collecting societies than I do. Um, and so I, I think one really has to distinguish between the representatives of collecting societies and, and the artists at large. Uh, and. Um, and of course, they say we speak for all the others, but actually they don't. Um, <laughs> recently, I was on a uh, on a plan, on a podium with the with with the uh, copyright speaker for the German Pirate Party. He himself, being an artist <laughs> for 30 years, <laughs> having his own label, and uh, half of his talk. He uh, just criticized uh, the GEMA, the German Collecting Society, for his practices. And what I showed before, I, I, re I really think they have such distribution problems. And the problem is also, especially in, in some cases, and in this regard, the collecting societies differ a lot in Europe. There are some collecting societies that are not only consisting of artists. So in the, uh, just recently in Germany, there was a, a ruling that um, the VG Wort, the Collecting Society for Authors, was not allowed to also uh, devote 
uh, funds that they are collecting to the publishers, what they did. And also in the GEMA, there are a lot of uh, labels and, and also other uh, not non uh, intermediaries that are part of. And, and then not only is the distribution very unequal, also the decision structures are very undemocratic. So my, my it's not easy, but I would say it's undemocratic in a way only 5% of GEMA members, are, for example, are allowed to vote. And these are the 5% uh, of members that are getting the highest um, uh, funding, uh, the uh, 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 remuner rem remuneration, I hate that word. Um, and, uh, and, and so I think when they are getting too aggressive, I would really go into counter uh, attacks because they, they really, ha ha and, and the third issue is the one Joe mentioned, that they fail to offer a one-stop shop on the European level. And, and this really is a barrier to, to innovation, to new business model, to a whole lot of things uh, for, 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 for Europe. And the, the final point uh, with regard to collecting societies relates to the last point I made in my presentation. Of course, again, there are differences, and that's also, in, in that case, it's good that there are differences between collecting societies in different countries. Because, for example, in Austria or Germany, collecting societies still don't allow their members to use any Creative Commons license for their work, which is a problem, of course, because this, uh, all professional artists are members of collecting societies, and they are not allowed to even license selected works under selected licenses, uh, such as, for example, a non-commercial license, which would preclude commercial uses, and therefore it would make perfectly sense to say, okay, I release it to the public so that no ordinary users can share this, can use it, but uh, when commercial use, such as radio, airplay, or uh, background music in a restaurant, then I also want to receive gamer loyalties, uh, royalty, royalties. Why not? And it's, and it's just, and, and they, can exp they cannot explain it, why not? In Austria, they sometimes uh, are very patriarchic, and they tell me, we have to protect the younger artists that don't understand Creative Commons correctly. Yeah, th then I'm really asking myself, are they uh, representing them, or are they... Uh, yeah, protecting them for themselves. I, I don't know. So I think there are a lot of problems with uh, collecting societies that are on, on their uh, side. But, and maybe one final point. Uh, I have deliberately spared out uh, one suggestion that has also have heated the debate for copyright reform in Europe. This is the idea of uh, sharing license or more... Um, uh, more levy-like uh, solutions to the file sharing issue because I think it would have taken another 30 minutes to expand on the pros and cons and the difficulties of these, uh, of these proposals, but I just can recommend to have a look at the book of Philippe Egrand from uh, La Quatre Dure du Net. It's called Sharing, and, uh, and he in a way describes some alternatives to redistributing uh, levy-based uh, copyright uh, uh, funds to artists. Thank you. So, questions? Okay. Um, I'm quite happy actually that you mentioned the book from uh, Peter Young because this was my, my question. Uh, you mentioned a, a lot of uh, different, uh, uh, different yes. ideas to, uh, to enhance the digital sharing of uh, uh, cultural content, but something you didn't uh, mention was this, uh, this idea of uh, uh, global license. So, well, of course it's a complicated uh, topic, but if you could, uh, both of you, uh, maybe give your opinion on this, and also tell us maybe why, why it's not discussed uh, at the EU level at the moment. I think it's a very interesting idea, and uh, we hear very little about this. Mm -hmm. um, okay. I have a follow-up question on the collecting societies issue. Um, yeah, I'm Thomas Schmeckers, but I'm also Belgian. We are home to a very uh, politically nasty collecting society which is involved in a lot of scandals. Um, the question I have is quite fundamental, actually. Um, these collecting societies, what they basically do, they're supposed to collect duties on copyrighted works and then somehow get this to the artists. But the, connect but the connection between those has become extremely non-trivial. What they basically do now is uh, levying taxes on all kinds of things, like uh, we got a letter yesterday, you own a copying machine, so please pay us a random amount for whatever. Um, if you want to organize a party, same thing. 
So, and also they, they are connected with what is essentially a law enforcement duty. Their controllers can come to your party that you have privately organized and hand you out a fine. You didn't pay us so uh, this much. So we are talking about an entity that collects taxes and enforces the law. Why on earth do we allow, allow a private entity, which is, even if it is at least theoretically a cooperative of artists, why do we allow an entity that is not the state to carry out these state duties? And why don't we just nationalize the them? Thank you. So, you please. Yes, um, thank you very much for uh, giving me to, uh, the opportunity to um, ask a question. I'm Julia Leda from the German youth organization Young Pirates. Um, especially in the German debate, there is uh, a lot of uh, um, talk about um, uh, a blanket funding model like a cultural flat rate. And um, I have a question for uh, Mr. Lobosch. Uh, you mentioned this study uh, with the Gini coefficient. And um, as a solution, uh, you said that we should try to broaden the income base uh, to help uh, artists. Now, um, when the models that are being discussed regarding cultural flat rates and so on usually uh, rely on some sort of uh, collecting society. Now, uh, the study that you have shown shows that the collection societies in particular are uh, uh, increasing the inequality in um, uh, the funding of artists. So I would uh, very much like to hear your opinion on that, uh, whether this would be a feasible model. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So, thank you. So I think we should now make a round of answers and then we continue the discussion. So who wants to take the floor first? Let me, can I start? Okay. Oh, okay. Leo and then Joe. Um, yeah, I think the first and the third question uh, closely relate because I can just really recommend to have a look in this, I think, fabulous book of Philippe Grand. Because I really think I, I'm co completely mispronouncing his name. I hope he, he doesn't mind. Um, but um, uh, he really makes a suggestion on how such, um, such blanket license funds could be distributed to not further increase the inequality. Uh, he makes, but, of, and why I, th I think, I don't think that the, the book uh, sharing from him is, has all the answers to this question. But, what I think he had delivered, and I think what we can see is this book, it, it's based on a, on, a, on a French book of 2008, and there's four years of discussion, French discussion, <laughs> in a way, is worked into the English edition that was published earlier this year. So it's, the English edition is from 2012, and we can learn a lot from, from what was de debated in France in that regard. And, th and this is why I think if we want to go into more uh, of these blanket and levy-based uh, remuneration schemes, uh, and I, I think this is a great point to start. Um, uh, still, however, and even Agran's uh, suggestions are national suggestions, uh, are suggestions for the national level. He would say all these uh, remuneration or, uh, schemes could be e more easily implemented still on a national level than on the European one. And uh, I'm, I'm hesitant to, to write out, endorse it, because, and this is also th something that I want to emphasize, and this is also why I left it out, because my whole talk was about um, reforming copyright without going into the discussion on file sharing, downloading, and pirates, because these issues are often mixed up. And I would say uh, the Agrin suggestion could be could be is, is something that we should really uh, think of as a solution to the file sharing problem, but it's not a, a solution to the problems that I described of of uh, transformative consumption of orphan works of fair use, because it's a, it's a it's a different problem in in terms of uh, of copyright law, and and so um, to answer your question, uh, what about the distribution problem? If we go into the and, and, and Volker Grasmu calls it sharing license, he prefers the term to cultural flat rate, but if we go into such a direction uh, and if we want to have acceptance among artists, I think it's necessary to also discuss the redistribution of, of the funds. And uh, my suggestion would be to start with the suggestion made by Agron. Thank you. Joe. Uh, this is um, a slightly um, politically difficult question for me because uh, our members have slightly different different views. 
and mm -hmm. there's at least one in the room, so I need to be careful. <laughs> um, the majority view is uh, the, against the idea of, uh, of a flat rate, or whatever you want to call it. Um, my personal uh, view of why a, a flat rate licensing system is uh, unwelcome is because uh, I spend my life um, racing around the corridors of, of this building um, trying to counteract the work of uh, an army of very well-paid uh, industry lobbyists who are trying to find repressive measures in order to uh, avoid dealing with the lack of innovation over many years in the uh, cultural sector. Giving that sector even more money for potentially even more lobbyists um, and a, uh, a guaranteed revenue stream um, to help them to avoid innovation still further um, is counterintuitive uh, to me. Um, on the question of um, uh, the Belgian situation, um, uh, the situation here is indeed um, extraordinarily bad as regards collecting societies. Uh, it's even worse regarding the um, Oh, no, it's not, it's not worse than Saban, but it's, it's as bad as Saban in the, uh, in the other private copying area, like uh, for printers and so on. Um, the, the cost of private copy levies uh, is enormous. Uh, I saw one calculation that said that approximately half of the cost of a levy is, is, is a loss to the economy. So for every one euro that... A, a, consumer spends on a levy, there is a 50 cent loss for, this, for the economy. So yes, there has to be a better way of, 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 uh, of doing this. Almost any way of doing it would be better than, than a system that is 50 percent uh, counterproductive. I don't believe that. Huh? No. Okay. okay. You want some? No, sure. Let's go ahead. Okay, let's go ahead. Uh, yeah, then, then you, and for the moment, you? Okay, you're thrilled. Thanks, my name is Henning Neuberger, I'm working as a study editor in the Parliament for Ehrlich and Bagel. I have just a question concerning the group position of the S&D fraction towards ACTA. Really, I know there have been a lot of discussions about whether to reject ACTA or not. Will the SD fraction reject ACTA in the intercommittee and in the plenary debate on the 3rd of July? Is there anything? It's easy. Thanks. I hope so. <laughs> Can I? Yeah. Can I, um, from my understanding, the answer is, is the group position is definitely no to ACTA. Um, there are, um, as, I, as, as, as I was accidentally um, caught on, on microphone saying before the start of the meeting, there are a few uh, parliamentarians from S&D that, uh, that don't agree. Um, I, I didn't answer part of one of the earlier questions, and now I've forgotten what it was I was going to say. Um, yeah, sorry. Mm -hmm. so, okay. So this was your question, yeah? Oh, yes. Yeah. Hello, my name is Susanne Kudrexel. I'm part of uh, the Socialist Youth Organizations in Austria. Um, my first question has already been asked, answered. It was about the distribution of income. Um, the second question I have is that um, you all mentioned in your speeches that the movement against ACTA was a very broad movement, especially in the civil society, and that without civil society it wouldn't have been possible to be where we are at the moment. Um, the other question is, uh, imagining that we are post-ACTA, can there be or is there already a movement just as broad and involving just as much of civil society for an alternative or is it more difficult to actually involve civil society in finding alternative ideas on, um, on what, for example, Leo suggested? Mm -hmm. And what, is, like, what are ways to include these people who are having ideas of what can we do differently now? Because usually um, the initiatives or proposals from the Commission, their expert groups, uh, they 
write the proposal? Who are those experts or who should those these experts be? Okay. Yeah. So to listen. Yeah. Um I've I remembered the point that <laughs> hadn't been addressed previously, uh, which is why why is flat rate not being discussed on, on a European level? Um, basically, uh, my understanding of uh, even informal discussions among the political groups is that um, the Liberals uh, are by default against it because it sounds too, um, too non-market. Uh, the Conservatives are, Conservatives are Conservatives are against it for broadly the same reason. So, so uh, you end up with a broad 70, 60 to 70 percent uh, majority of parliamentarians that simply are not interested in that as an approach. Um, so it's politically it's it's difficult to do anything with. Uh, as I said, that's not something that makes me particularly sad. Um, the the question about the civil society, unfortunately, it's easier to say no than to say yes. Um, so I think, I hope, firstly, that ACTA is defeated, and that when and if ACTA is defeated, that the people that went out on the street realize that it is possible to change things, and that when the next policy comes up, that everyone is going to be as active as, as the last time. However, I cannot imagine somebody, uh, are, I would love to be wrong, but if, uh, if there was a proposal to uh, make all of the exceptions and limitations to copyright mandatory uh, starting on the 1st of December, I can't imagine 100,000 people going out in the streets going, we support the reform of Article 5 of the Directive 2001-29 EC on exceptions and limitations to copyright. Uh, hooray. Um, but I could be wrong. Um, yeah. Leo? Um, I'm a notorious optimist, so <laughs> uh, I, I, I'm, I'm, of course, I think it's always easier to be against something because you don't need to agree on, on the alternative. Yeah? And, and so people who want the sharing license and people who don't want the sharing license, they both can agree on they don't want ACTA, <laughs> even if they are not, um, they don't have the same point. Uh, but what makes me a little bit more optimistic is uh, that I have the impression that a lot of different different movements focusing on different issues that are related, I, I sometimes call it the open movements, so open source software, open education, open access, open data, if you want to call it open government, uh, or free software, uh, and, and, and that in that regard, um, these movements are very nascent still. They are very, uh, and they are emerging. And I have the impression they are, they are all positive movements. They, they are not against something, but they want open and free access to educational material. They want open and free access to software. They want code. They want open and free access to, to research. But they all agree that the common uh, copyright regime is flawed. And I have, um, and, and this makes me hope, because I think to get something done, it requires more than going out on the streets. So uh, you, you have to, uh, to, to, to build organizations. You have to organize in a way. And you, may, you also have, and uh, not all uh, of you here will have found it uh, such absurd as others might do, you also have to talk to, for example, parties. <laughs> you have to talk to politicians. You have to engage maybe in parties. And I have the impression this is, and this is maybe brings me to, to the, the uh, quotation I started with, uh, Douglas Adams, and uh, that this is a generational issue. And in Ger I can just speak about the situation in Germany, and I, I have to admit that with regard to copyright politics, I more agree, for example, with young members of the Christliche uh, Soziale Union in Bayern, uh, so, so this, this, uh, in some regards, not in all, in some regards, uh, at least they are for fair use, and they are for, and so on. Uh, then I agree with, for example, older uh, representatives of parliament of the Social Democrats there, because they are so, um, yeah, outdated <laughs> uh, that they, they, it's very difficult to, exp they, they really, they print out their internet, yeah? And, and that's, uh, that's the problem. And, and so this is, this is what makes me slightly more optimistic, that I would say the, the next generation of also politicians and, and activists is much more aware of the possibilities of, of, uh, and of the, of the options. 
so that it's possible that, and one last sentence, because uh, Joe, you said that when the next policy comes up, and I think that's too late. <laughs> I think the, the next policy must be our policy. Yeah? We should suggest the next policy. And this is something uh, that I hope and that I expect also from, from the social democrats that they not wait until IP red uh, novel uh, next level uh, IP enforcement uh, is on the table. I expect to bring their own proposals to the table. I'm looking for try to catch people's eyes. So you, who else? Because I would like to make the the final round in the two. Okay, so let's take the two of you, and then we make a final round here, and we will also make some remarks. Okay. So. Ah, sorry. <laughs> you. Thank you. Um, I'm an SND uh, uh, assistant to, to an MEP who sits in the Internal Market Committee and uh, we shadowed a report on Orphan Works, uh, on, on the Orphan Works Directive that um, I, don't, I don't think it has been through the plenary yet. No. Uh, but um, we, we just touched on it quite tangentially. We're not experts. No one in the office. And indeed, a lot of people came uh, to meet us from the industry, from uh, uh, broadcasters' organizations. Uh, and uh, it, it's a really, I, I regret we didn't, have the, we didn't have the opportunity to meet at the time. Uh, there was a lot of effort to safeguard the role of um, uh, collective uh, licensing uh, institutions. Uh, and. Um, I, I'd like to know a, a, a bit more in detail what, what your views of the, the, the work that has been done by the European Parliament uh, on that matter. Uh, I, I'd, I'd like to hear your assessment. And, and also I'd like to ask bo both speakers uh, how often they engage with the Commission and uh, if they get the opportunity to at all, because I heard, I heard the other speaker uh, expressing his gratitude for the chance to finally address Brussels and the EU level uh, here with us. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hi there, I've got a question. Um, on Monday, there was an interesting debate uh, organized by Mrs. Gallop uh, for the EP, and it was about finding the balance uh, between access, uh, uh, access, copyrights, and remuneration. And my question is like, because today we are um, talking about, uh, we are more enthusiastic about open access and things like this, whereas on Monday we had so many things about like how copyrights are in danger. So uh, would it be possible to organize an event when we actually can bring authors and all the enthusiasts of open access together so they can talk to each other? Yeah, and sure. maybe then we can find uh, a way forward because at the moment it's like what people you know one people who are like uh, really worried about uh, uh, copyrights uh, they say one things and then we organize another conference and we um, are enthusiastic about open access and things like that but people they don't really share ideas they don't really talk to each other and that's I think that's an issue at the moment thank you so yes, please, Joe and then Leo and then Joe <laughs> uh, okay, Orphan Works, um, as uh, you'll have noticed from the uh, list of, of threats, uh, we have quite uh, a lot of uh, dossiers to, to follow. Um, we uh, took the decision not to follow the Orphan Works Directive because um, there are three people in our office and uh, my hair wasn't grey three years ago. Um, the, the, my my view is that the the, the uh, compromise that's been agreed is is too complicated. is not It's not easy enough for people to get access. It, it remains there remains too big of a barrier between citizens and and orphan works. Um, I'm infuriated by the fact that a lot of the the political momentum on orphan works seems to have been um, a uh, this a strange anti anti Google uh, front uh, in this house, which insists on designing policies which help Google more than anybody else. Yeah. Um, 
because the situation is so complicated, only very big companies with very big bank balances and very big uh, legal teams will be able to, uh, to get through the complexity. And um, a lot of the, the, the safeguards are not safeguards to protect the authors. They're actually the opposite. Um, I was told by one company that shall remain nameless that's involved in online digitization uh, that they're allowed to digitize certain cookbooks on condition uh, that the publisher prevents them from making them public. Um, the reason for this is because if you make cookbooks from the 1940s available today, uh, food hasn't changed, so they will compete. So the, the rights owner of the, uh, of the older books, the books for which the author can't be found, is being deliberately discriminated against by the publishers who are coming to the European Parliament saying that they're defending the interests of of the uh, of the rights of the the creators. Um, the question about how often we engage with uh, with the Commission. Um, absolutely, I don't know where the question came from anymore. There. Um, oh, sorry, you as well. Um, absolutely, all of the time. Um, the I sometimes wish that I could complain that it's impossible to get a meeting with people in the Commission um, because I could save some time. Um, uh, with, with one or two exceptions, uh, coincidentally and notably the um, uh, unit responsible for, for ACTA, um, officials are, genuinely, are gen generally very open uh, to, to dealing with civil society. Um, I, I can, at, right up to the, the, the highest levels in the Commission, uh, they're open, they want to hear our point of view. Um, I need to clarify one point as regards when the next when the next proposal comes out. I'm not saying wait for the next proposal uh, to come out before doing something. What is tremendously helpful for me is the fact that there that there is a perception of people that want proper copyright law in Europe. So two weeks ago, I had a very long meeting with the head of unit responsible for the IPR enforcement directive. Um, and um, I know him for a very long time. We have very productive meetings anyway. But as a uh, as a <coughs> as a, a Brussels voice for a lot of the concerns that the people who demonstrated, my my interaction with the Commission on that point <coughs> now is very different from the from my interaction when it was. Edry as an as as just a group of associations. Now there's there's a movement, there's a noise, there's a there's us as interpreters between the noise on the street and the policymakers. Uh, and we we are going. We I spent an hour and a half going through the the detail of IPRED and what is broken, what could be fixed, what we need to avoid breaking, um, and uh, that's. Thanks to each person that, that made the effort to, to go out on, onto the streets. Um, are we doing our final summary now? Yeah. Um, yeah. So you looked at me when you said, and we, we even agree with the, with the CSU in, in Bayern. Some of my best friends are, are conservatives. I've not, I have nothing against conservatives at all. Commissioner Redding, uh, who is a, a conservative, has been a ferocious defender of, uh, of digital rights uh, since she took over her office three years ago. Um, to conclude, it's very interesting to note that ACTA now is far more than ACTA. Um, ACTA has become a test of the European institutional framework. Mm -hmm. um, for Europe to work, the European Parliament needs to be a strong institution. The European Commission used a very obvious um, trick, essentially, to try to stop this, this institution from making a decision on, on ACTA. They referred the, the dossier to the European Parliament, and having referred it to the European Parliament, they said, oh, hang on, they might say no. Let's refer it to the European Court of Justice until after the next elections, and then 
it'll be another, everyone will have forgotten and it will go through. The European Parliament so far has said, no, we're the political institution, we make the decision. This is a really big step for the European Parliament. In the Data Retention Directive, uh, the Council put pressure on the Parliament and, and the Parliament capitulated. This is a, was a few years ago. Yeah. This is yeah. several years ago, but it's yeah. a. Um, the European Parliament also needs to define itself as a democratic institution. And it has looked around Europe, it has looked at what people uh, did in going out into the streets, it listened to what people said about why they didn't want ACTA, and broadly it's, uh, it's responding. The, the Federalists. Uh, <coughs> have always said that we must do something to create a European political movement. We need mm -hmm. issues to become European and not national. And that's exactly what ACTA, ACTA has done. So ACTA, sometime in, in February or March, ACTA left ACTA behind. ACTA isn't ACTA anymore. ACTA is a test of the, the institutional maturity of the entire European, uh, European process. And um, the people that are still campaigning in this parliament to prevent this parliament from, from, uh, from making a decision, I cannot understand how somebody could be so self-defeating. Um, so if ACTA is defeated, this institution will have grown, will have changed, and will have you people to, to, to thank for it. So uh, let's hope that the Parliament does what is in our interests, your interests, and in, in its own interests. Thank, Thank you. Leo? Um, I, can be, I can be brief. I can agree with everything you said. Uh, I, I didn't mean that I, I, I cannot be befriended with uh, conservatives, but in terms of um, well, of internet policies uh, normally, and, and the majority also of that party is the one who wanted to introduce censorship on the net, and even though uh, that's what, what I, the point I wanted to make, not that it's absurd to, <laughs> to agree with the conservatives once in a while. Um, the second um, thing is uh, the other questions raised I can answer quickly. To me, it's completely the other way around. I have abs absolutely never talked to the commission, which is probably, uh, the reason for that is probably that I'm a researcher and not a lobbyist. Uh, and with, that brings me to the, the last point. Um, uh, I think uh, what is missing, and, and I tried to present some uh, evidence for, and, and some data, some studies, but the majority of studies that are out there are not independently funded. That's just really the, whole, the, the main problem. Any time a lobbyist tells you, and these are the millions of dollars that are lost due to file sharing, it's always a lie, because I uh, at least don't know any uh, study that was independently financed that would uh, come to a similar result. That doesn't mean, of course, that independently funded studies, the few that they are, that they agree. No, of course not. <laughs> but, but actually, that's um, what, what makes them more credible than all the industry-funded studies that all tell the same uh, but plainly wrong story. So I would say this is also something that if we are going post-ACTA, that we really should have a look at more evidence, but independent evidence, not manufactured evidence. And um, yeah, and that's why I'm glad that I had the possibility to speak here uh, today and to present some pieces of evidence. Thank okay, you. so thank you, Leo.